Ladies and gentlemen, I'm Mark Zakaria. This is Common Sense. Welcome back. It's my interview with Carolyn Medeiros, Executive Director of the Alliance for Safe Communities here in Rhode Island. And if you've been following, Carolyn and I have been talking about the Alliance, how it came to be, and some of the victories that it's had already. Carolyn, can we talk now about what you, in the immediate future for the Alliance, what sorts of things either are left undone or new things you're going to add to the hopper now that you've got some other accomplishments? Well, this year we um, put in a legislation regarding registration of sex offenders at homeless shelters. The law, as it says, is that a sex offender has to register within 24 hours as to where they're living to local law enforcement. So that's the law. But apparently when they've been going to some of our homeless shelters like Harrington Hall in Cranston, Harrington Hall, Joe Smith comes in and they don't pick up the phone and notify the police sometimes for up to a week. We had one case with an individual who had a record of raping three women, an inmate in the prison, putting a correctional office in the hospital, four B&Es and three larcenies. And they waited like five days before they even got around to saying, guess where Bruce is hiding? Okay? So they found, they're saying there's a loophole in the law, but I'm saying they made me create a law telling them you need to follow the existing law. You're not special. Now their argument in the Senate committee was, well, you know, there's a couple reasons why we don't get along, get around to doing this. We might have a sh be short-staffed and there's a, a toilet that's clogged. I just sat there speechless over that. Or the other thing they said was the Social Worker Code of Ethics states that we don't have to disclose the, this, for, this type of identity and criminal background to law enforcement when they arrive to live in our shelters. Senator Lombardi, Senator Lombardi poignantly picked out, pointed out to um, one of the staffers at Harrington, what you see in front of you, young lady, is a law. You will follow this law, or if you break the law, you will go to prison. So we had to go, it passed the Senate unanimously. It went through the Senate Judiciary. We did a sub A because the consequences were a little tough. We put the consequences on a tier system. And so it was monetary fines of $100, $500, and then $5,000 for one year incarceration instead of the old consequences of immediate incarceration of $5,000. So we watered it down for them. It went through the Senate unanimously. And ironically, in the House, I, I uh, approached Charlene Lima and asked her to take the bill as sponsor. And she wanted to. But Speaker Mattiello said, oh, no, I'll be the sponsor. And you Cranston reps can be the co-sponsors. And we waited, and we waited. Senators approached him, reps approached him. I had co-sponsors, sponsors jumping over me from other districts, not just Cranston. Yeah. And he stymied the bill. He, made, he never allowed that bill to get through the House. Am I correct that Harrington Hall is in his district? Yes, it is. <laughs> and, and, his, and his elected constituents to, should know what he did, because Councilman Lombardi at the Senate committee testified at that time there were 49 sex offenders packed in that shelter out of 80 men. And could I also go so far as to infer that the big customer of this new law is, in this case, Cranston PD. They're the ones that don't know that these people are concentrated in Harrington Hall right in the middle of their jurisdiction, and by extension, any other town where a similar treatment facility or homeless shelter is located, the local police departments are basically in the dark until the sex offender registers with them. Chris, P actually has an officer assigned to Harrington Hall and is paid a certain salary <laughs> per year that's supposed to be monitoring just Harrington Hall, okay? So when they don't register them, he eventually has to go there, track them down, and pull them out of there, and they're in violation. So they're setting up their own residence anyway. Another thing I found out from doing multiple freedom of releases, okay, to get information about what it was costing to run Harrington Hall. It cost the taxpayers $200,000 in rescue and fire runs to Harrington Hall in the course of six months, okay, from like October to March. That was for basic life support and advanced life support. Most of these runs that they're doing, police and rescue, is drug overdosing, brawling, and fighting. And, and you say the taxpayers are paying for this. Yes. It would be the taxpayers of the city of Cranston. Yes, yes. So predominantly and that, yes. Cranston. Yes. And so there's a big overhead expense. Not only do they have to assign a separate officer, that means there's, there's another person yes. full-time on that problem only, but there's another couple hundred thousand per year 
in, uh, in required uh, uh, response time uh, yes, expenses and, that they get. Yes, and I met with the fire chiefs and they told me how rescues were going there and rescue workers were being assaulted and beaten on. And they were telling me they were concerned about the fact that they had to divert resources. So Machanic at Vista, that's for the elderly, which is right next to the fire station, if that fire station's out at Harrington Hall doing brawls and overdoses and an elderly woman's having a stroke, guess what? She's going to have to wait for a rescue coming from Diarath. Okay, so you're going to revisit this and uh, you're working on it in the next session. Are there any new bills that you're looking at that, uh, that you plan to have come up or things that you will now be introducing for the first time? Ironically, after this bill was killed, which I directly address our speaker, Mattiello, for this, why did you not move this bill through? The Senate was, was constantly asking you what you were doing. Representatives were approaching you. I was approaching you. And you let the session go through. It's all, was you, were you unable or were you unwilling to do this? I don't know. Um, but we are going to reintroduce this bill. It had passed as a city resolution. The entire city of Cranston was behind this as well. They sent the resolution up to you, Mr. Mattiello, which the Senate passed unanimously and you failed to act on it, I will be putting it back in. The city of Cranston will be putting that resolution back in. And in my research, um, Mark, I found that um, the Registry of Sex Offenders has issues in it of itself that all Rhode Islanders through the state should be concerned about. And we will be addressing that up and coming as well. We're going, within, within the next week or so, the news media will be covering it. What sort of issues? Well, if you go to the registry right now, you're going to see the, the expectation of Rhode Islanders is that when you go to the registry of sex offenders, you're going to find where Joe Smith, a level three, high, high degree of reoffending, is living in your community. You may just go there and find that it's listed as address pending or address unknown or homeless or home, okay? That is not acceptable. That does not tell me where Joe Smith lives. It tells me he's a level three sex offender, okay? We also found that there are clusters of sex offenders. A cluster is what I call two or more sex offenders living in the same residence or on the same street. There were tons of clusters, especially in Providence, Woonsocket, and West Warwick and Central Falls. We just said 49 in Harrington Hall alone. 49 in Harrington Hall. Now that they, they removed some since the Alliance took action with that bill. House of Hope that was running Harrington Hall, the contract was taken from them. But there are still like 14 to 16 sex offenders at Emanuel House in Providence. So we're clustering them now. We need to be getting, concerned. Getting back, if we could, to the registry and some of the things you're going to be looking to do with it in the next session, seems to me that the great use for it would be that uh, people would look for their town and see how many sex offenders were in their town. So instead of looking by name, I, I confess I don't know the names of any sex offenders, but I might want to look and see if there are any that are registered in my town. Presumably that's a problem too if there's uh, a pending or unknown, uh, you, so you, there's no town associated. Ironically, when we did further research, we found that some that were addressed as pending actually do have addresses. So I have no idea why they're putting an address as pending when they actually are living somewhere. And so that could be the slowness of the paper mill trying to get the registry updated. Listen, obviously all this new documentation is going to greatly benefit child free zones, child safe zones. And, uh, and uh, I think that we look forward to seeing you being able to do that. We're going to take a break now because it's uh, your last shot at Are You Kidding Me? And we'll be back with Carolyn Medeiros right after the break.